That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Out of the Blue, the 11th film directed by Neil LeBute, which Quiver Distribution is releasing August 26, 2022. Do I know any of Neil's other films? Yes, you do. Uh, back in the... It was a playwright uh, that uh, kind of became a Generation X cutting-edge filmmaker out of Sundance in the late 90s, thanks to In the Company of Men, and then Your Friends and Neighbors in 1997-98. Uh, Nurse Betty, which I'd like to rewatch, uh, where... A TV show? No. Nurse oh. Betty. Uh, what's uh, your t- what's that Edie Falco film? Oh, that's called Nurse Betty. That's called some... That's Nurse Jackie. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, Nurse Betty, which I remember Renee Zellweger winning something like a Golden Globe for, plays this uh, derailed woman obsessed with a soap opera star being trailed by Chris Rock and Morgan Freeman. I remember being really interesting. Um, But kind of slowed his role with a really bad remake of The Wicker Man, uh, starring Nicolas Cage. Uh, After that, he had several other films, including Lakeview Terrace, which I know you're familiar with. Yes. uh, Which I remember liking Samuel Jackson in. And uh, Death at a Funeral, he remade that 2007 British comedy in 2010 with Chris Rock, uh, which I was not exactly a fan of. And since then, has uh, every now and then kind of popped up a lot in television, but uh, in the indie film world. I did like his 2013 film, Some Velvet Morning, starring Alice Eve and Stanley Tucci. Uh, but his last movie was 2015's Dirty Weekend, which I, I don't believe I've seen. Uh, anyway, he's set to have three films released this year. Uh, this is the first of them. What did you think about this movie? I really didn't like it. I think it's it's super strangely derivative uh, I don't know where we got to a point where movies are playing homage and directly referencing them as uh, an okay to just you know rip them off uh, this is this plays like a film that would have been cutting edge in the early 2000s I borderline hated this movie I was so annoyed the entire time and it just got worse as it went on and the ending is ridiculous which is it's, it's surprising because the first play I ever saw in New York was I flew to see The Mercy Seat, starring Sigourney Weaver, uh, directed by Neil LeBute in 2002. He's a really good writer. Uh, it, it, to me, it shocked me how kind of flaccid this is. Okay, the basic story, it's set in modern time. There's a young man named Connor. Connor Bates. He's like a handsome 25-year-old, maybe. Mm -hmm. We find out he was just released from prison, where he did three years for assault. But it's set up like, it was sort of like self-defense. So he seems like a good guy. He's smart, clean cut. He's now living in this small town in Rhode Island, which is where he's from. Mm -hmm. So he's back home, working at a library, just trying to start his life over again. One day, he's running... And he runs by this beach area and sees a woman in a red bathing suit, Diane Kruger. Playing Marilyn Chambers. Who I keep thinking is Nicolette Sheridan. But (laughs) he meets her, kind of tries to push up on her, and she's like, boy, please. But he mentions to her where he works, and then we see her visit his job. And then she's flirting with him at his job, gives him her phone number. With dark sunglasses and a bruised eye. Which is the beginning. I mean, we all know where this is going. So he calls her. They start hanging out. And it's a story we've seen in many film noirs or like the movie To Die For where this older woman is trying to convince this younger man that she needs to get rid of her husband. Namely, you kill him. Mm -hmm. You do it, Norbit. Mm -hmm. So he does. She convinces this fool very easily. I'd love a film noir with Respucia. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I like Norbert. There are parts of Norbert where I have to fast forward. Mostly. I think you fast forward through all of Tandawa's yeah. moments. But anyway. Yeah. Anytime Respuch is on screen, that's what I watch. But um, he agrees, I'll kill your husband because he's so awful to you. And that's the only way we can be together. He shows up. She, she's like, oh, great. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to go out of town for two days. Mm, me uh, in Boston. Yeah. So that's perfect time for you to kill my husband. So he goes to the house. And it's clear he doesn't know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. The husband is there, but the husband gets the upper hand on his ass. Like, he has a gun, and it seems like the husband's going to shoot and kill Connor when all of a sudden the husband gets hit in the back of the head with a fire poker. And it's this other guy we've met previously in the film. He is. So, Nicolette Sheridan has a stepdaughter. Mm hmm. 
Astrid. She has a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And that, what's, well, whatever that man's name is. Jared. Jared. He knows Connor. They went to like high school together. So Connor sees Jared like, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, well, I was here to rob the place and I saw he was about to kill you. So you're welcome. And Connor kills Jared. And then sets it up like it was self-defense, like, mm -hmm. you know, the husband killed the, the, the intruder. So as the audience, we're like, okay, good. He's going to get away with it, which is not good. But, but then the police show up at his house to say, like, we have proof that you were at that house. The proof is the first time he goes to visit Nicolette Sheridan... He loses, like, his keychain, which is, like, a keepsake. Mm -hmm. It's very important to him. He can't find it. He doesn't know where it is. And then, of course, immediately we're like, oh, this lady took it to set his ass up for something. And that's what she did. So she provides that to the police. And then he, when they try to arrest him, he makes a break for it, which we could talk about because that was a funny scene. And then he goes to his secret spot, that beach area where he met her. And the police are waiting for him there. Of course, she told the police where he would be. And they're going to arrest him. But before they can, he reaches into his pocket to grab his ringing phone. Even though they tell him, don't do that or we're going to shoot you. He does it anyway. They shoot and kill his ass. The end, but not really. Because the final scene is Nicolette Sheridan and her stepdaughter are on this yacht. Because the husband was very rich. And immediately when... Nicolette comes into the room where the daughter is. It seems like a seductive scene. It's because these two are not family. They're lovers. Mm -hmm. And they both were in cahoots to get rid of... Richard. Not, not only the, the, the dad, the husband, but the two men they had been canoodling with. Mm -hmm. The end. Yes. Oh my God. There isn't anything about this movie I like. Out of the Blue, including its title, which uh, there are several films named Out of the Blue, including a Dennis Hopper film from 1980. When Nicolette goes to the library, Connor's job, she's like, like you mentioned, black glasses, looking all sad, like, oh, my husband beats me up. And then she looks up, she wants Connor to help her find some books. Guess what kind of books she's looking for? She's like, I'm looking for books on murder. <laughs> Books where the husband dies. Um, Diane Kruger as Marilyn Chambers, which is the name of a very famous adult entertainer in the 70s who starred in David Cronenberg's Rabid, which I find interesting. What is Meryl Streep's name in Death Becomes Her? Uh, it's Madeline Ashton, I believe. Oh, Madeline Ashton. Anyway, Marilyn Chambers is a real-life porn star uh, who was in horror films. Uh, she is the world's most boring, obvious, see-through femme fatale. And Can we talk about that then for a second? Because I don't have anything against this lady. I don't even know her. But I think that... That's how she's written. She's very basic looking. This could have been any 50-something-year-old white lady who doesn't eat. So I think we need at least one scene where she's like va-va-boom. Sure. In some kind of way for us to understand that this younger guy who's good looking Ray is Nich like smitten by her. Ray Nicholson, yeah. And we get one scene where she's like out having lunch with her stepdaughter and Jared. And she's just in her little Ann Taylor shit with her barrel curls. She looks fine like someone's mom or like, you know, she's going to work. But for most of the movie, she looks kind of bedraggled. Like, I know they think they're giving like Elizabeth Taylor and Suddenly Last Summer when we first, or like Halle Berry and the Bond movie were getting out of the ocean. That lady looks like a drowned, harassed rat. Like her, that old thin, fine ass, wet ass, flat ass hair stuck to her head. Like <laughs> I think Diane Kruger looks very well preserved. She's got great skin. She does, you know, I stood next to her in LA and didn't realize it was, it was her. Uh, you know, yeah, she does look like a lot of other women, but I think her, her character, it's the screenwriter and director who has made her so. Kind of and bland and like unappealing. And because then we get scenes of her in a car talking to Connor and those angles are not flattering. Like just, it, it just, I needed to better understand like, yeah, we need you're going to gonna get into what should have been the motivation. But anyway. we need to understand the, the seduction element. But that first scene where he stumbles on her in the, this private cove that she goes to, that should have felt, you know, she's supposed to be a siren, right? She's rising out of the water. She's, her, her image has seduced him, but that, you know, kind of ends there. But I wanted this, I wanted her 
to, to feel like a spider. Like he's literally walk, walked into a web and she's going to, you know, drain him is the energy that we needed to have from this, especially because the books she checks out from the library that we keep referencing are James M. Cain's The Postman Always Rings Twice, excellent film that starred Lana Turner uh, and then was remade with Jessica Lange in 1980 or 81. Uh, and there's a, a German version directed by Christian Petzold. Like that movie's been told a lot of times and also Double Indemnity by, by Raymond Chandler. It really doesn't take uh, any detours from the plots of either of those two films except for when we get this twist about the other man in the uh, house while he's supposed to commit this murder and the, this lesbian th this lesbianism in the end which Steven Soderbergh did a decade ago in Side Effects and that didn't feel uh, cutting edge then. It's just so predictable from the moment she asks for those books what's happening and she shows up with a black eye. We don't see the black eye. She says she has a black she, eye. There's some light. Or is there? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. And she has like marks on her arm. She does. Finger marks. Yeah. Okay. Hank Azaria is in the movie playing Connor's... His jacket says probation, but I think it should probably mean parole officer. Well, he went to... Uh, jail on assault charges. It's very. But he's there for three years. Wouldn't that be prison? It's very. I don't know. It's I don't very know Nicolas that. Cage and Con Air. Okay. I hated that characterization because it was so unnecessarily uncomfortable. This character that Hank Azaria is playing is so mean and nasty to not only Connor in the beginning, but the patrons of this diner where he's having his meeting with him. Mm -hmm. It just seems so unnecessary. And then why make him so vile? To then make then him saying like, well, I care about you. And then the final scene where Hank's character is like, I had to beg the sheriff to let me come see you first before they grabbed you. Like, I just want to help you. Really? It seems like you're like a fucking monster. Like, that characterization was terrible. And then also, I'm just so bored with like, have like every depiction of a probation or parole officer in a film just makes them out to be like these awful dicks. Well, but but sure. not that it's not based in truth, but it's just like it's. On top of everything else being so predictable, and in addition to Hank Azaria's character, there's a sheriff officer mm -hmm. who, I mean, that characterization is laughably Fred, bad. Fred Weller, who's... That uh, acting was terrible. Who's in The Shape of Things, also directed by Neil Buick. And it's not their fault. I'm, you know, like the director uh, told him to do it, maybe. I don't know, but it is... So cringy, uncomfortable. That that dialogue is egregiously terrible. That's my next note. The dialogue, trash. The lighting is so weird. Like this film has no mood. It's all brightly lit, like a like a Hallmark movie. Which there are uh, Technicolor noirs like uh, Simply Scarlet and Niagara is a good example sure. of that. But again, there's got to be a tone set somewhere, and a good way to well, do that is lighting. Well, particularly the sex scenes. There are three sex scenes. Right? If we include the oral sex. Mm -hmm. the oh, well, the first sex scene is in this library with her stepdaughter, who, of course, we find out is not her stepdaughter, it's her lover. But Nicolette Sheridan goes to visit Connor to his job at the library. Mm -hmm. There are other people there. And she takes him, he takes her downstairs to look for a book on Coco Chanel. Even that dialogue where he asks the daughter, do you want to know about the clothing line? Or... The woman. The woman. And she's like, I don't know. A little of both. A little of both. I guess a biography. Like, what? Mm -hmm. They go downstairs and she just plops him on the center table, like in the middle of this downstairs portion of the library, and goes down on him in the most unrealistic... Her head is nowhere near his waist. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, that lighting was weird. Then we get a sex scene at her house where the, the angles are weird because we're watching it through the door, like, at a distance. Then we get a sex scene, like, out in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's just all so, like... And that library is very archaic. Yeah, they're using the card system. And the girls, uh, uh, Astrid's like, I have to write some emails while you get this Coco Chanel book and just goes and stands by a stack of books and on her phone does the email. So they're not even going to have computers at this library? Okay, there's a device used that drove me crazy. Oh, yeah. Is there are title cards throughout the film saying, like, <laughs> two days later, last night, or tomorrow night, or... But the, the, the times that they reference make no sense. A little later that afternoon... Two to three days later. Like, what? And it's not like two or three of them. It's a... Well, how many would you say? Like 20? They're, yes. They're like 20 title cards in this 90-minute movie telling you that something happened two to three days later, a couple weeks later, later that night. Well, it's, and it's almost like it's supposed to be comedic. 
Right, but there, but there are no jokes. There's no comedic tone. Well, and that, I think we had a, most of our discussion after this film was whether it's kind of on purpose, which which begs this discussion of uh, of camp versus kitsch. Like, is this a failure or is it on purpose being terrible? <laughs> We can talk about that at the end, but there could be a drinking game every time Connor mentions that he runs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, we know nothing about this character except that he likes to run. He's in good <laughs> shape, yes. And he's in good shape. Um, I thought the writing of Astrid's boyfriend was really uncomfortable because he's a person of color and they make him seem kind of like a thug in that very generic, like... I'm a 60-year-old white man who lives in New England who this, thinks this is what black thugs are like or something. Like, it's just so dated, the way yes. they wrote this character. Everything about it's dated, yeah. And, like, what Astrid sees in him, because her characterization, she's just as flat and dead as she was in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Like, it's just... Chase, we wonders. Yes. Uh, who, you know, I remember that film. She was supposedly uh, a great actress who starred as Hedda Gabler. So when Connor gets to the house to kill the husband... At when he first arrives, he's wearing this mask that looks like the mask from, uh, what's that movie? The Strangers. Is that what I'm thinking? Pray so he's night. wearing this silly mask, like one of those clear masks that have like rouge and eyeshadow and lipstick on it. And he's lurking around the house. He doesn't see the husband. And then it seems like he might give up when all of a sudden the husband pops up on the phone, like talking, goes upstairs and Connor waits at the base of the stairs and doesn't like assault him or anything he just stares at him and the guy it makes a noise and the guy turns around and then runs up the stairs mm -hmm. so then connor runs after him falls down the stairs or trips and like i i just thought this was all so stupid what was your plan like then gets upstairs they start fighting and this man who appears to be bigger than connor but old er gets the upper hand the, i just thought the writing of that scene was so stupid i know that they were doing it to set up the boyfriend yeah, yeah yeah killing him but it was so poorly done i just think everything about nicholson's performances he is he, uh, now i'm thinking is he is he related to jack anyway uh because oh. uh, i'm not he's in licorice pizza he must be that must be. anyway he i don't think he's really well cast he doesn't isn't suited for somebody that should have kind of a harder edge like maybe a boyd holbrook or uh some and they paint him to be kind of rather saintly, even though he's had, you know, this accidental uh, brush with the law. And I think it really needed to be about money. They, I, I think that there's a way to make him still seem kind of innocent, as in he needed the money for a good cause, like a sibling that he needed to rescue from an abusive parent. His mom's something. losing her house yes. or something like something, that but, while he was in prison. Along with the sexual allure of this uh, femme fatale, he needed, it needed to be about the money. Yeah, because in twenty twenty, if it's just based on Nicola Sheridan, it's like <clears throat> th that lady's giving nothing, nothing. These sex scenes look dry as hell. I don't know what he, and then he's a handsome guy, and his coworker, this woman at the library, she is sprung on him, and she's a beautiful lady. Well, those bangs are, well, yeah. sure, but he does I, a shot of her from behind, and I can see her bangs moving every time she blinks. Well, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. That, that 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 is annoying but anyway like i i just needed to better understand like how is this good looking young man who has options is so sprung on this lady who's not promising him anything it, it's just so weird well and that leads to murder like he's agreeing to murder somebody and he then we see all the trouble he's having with law enforcement his probation officer the sheriff uh there's someone in the town makes a comment to him i believe like he understands that his previous brush with the law has really ruined his life. Why would he then contemplate murder? But he's <laughs> intimately aware with the plot of The Postman Always Rings Twice. The fact that he has to conjure elements of that plot at random throughout okay. the film. And she, you know you've lost an object. You told her not to call your phone and she does after the murder. That needs to be repeated. This boy who works in the library recommended a book about a woman setting up a man to kill her husband. Like, he knows this book. He knows the story. He gives it to her, and then it's playing out in real time, and he's not not the wiser. No. Not a bit. Not the least bit dubious about what the fuck this, she's doing. This needed to be judged up quite a bit with something like, there's a, a triple double cross going on where he is also seeing Astrid, who's trying to screw over her something. stepmother. And... and 
This could like, have been like fun. wild things or yeah, something. Yeah, this could have been fun if they would have done that crazy shit. But then the scene where the police come to arrest him and he makes a break for it, the way he's running, he's like flailing. Yeah, it's like I thought you were good at that. But, yeah, I'm like I thought you were good at running. Then the sheriffs are chasing him, and it's these like out of shape sheriff officers, like kind of trotting after him. They give up right away, but it's come to find it's because they got this anonymous tip from a woman that Hank Azaria is screaming at him in, in the. Uh, in the climax, it's like, would that? Ha- I, how did you know I this was? This movie here? made me uncomfortable. That like, the, it's predictable. That the dialogue's terrible. There's no mood. There's nothing fun about it. I just like, there's nothing about this movie I enjoyed. If you think about some of these great, and you get constant shots, you get clips of uh, Edward G. Robinson and Humphrey Bogart, and uh, you know a clip from one of my favorite cheapy noirs, uh, Detour, starring Anne Savage. It's like if you think of something like Detour, for instance, was which was made on you know this nothing of a budget, but had great writing and a phenomenal characterization. Where is that? Where? How did we lose that ability? What would you give this movie? One. I would give it, I feel like I have, I'll give it one. I thought you wanted to return to that conversation of camp versus kitsch. Oh, yeah, so one out of five. I think I'm so annoyed also because it feels like, because we I have watched, a, I, like, we watch a lot of, I mean, I'm talking about myself, like, I watch a lot of movies, and I feel like there's this trend of filmmakers like, maybe they don't have the resources to do what they really want, but they've been given an opportunity so here's $2 million, make this movie. And then it's like, well, from a marketing standpoint and for business purposes, like, how can we get people to stream this thing? Do we make a film in earnest? That's, you know, okay, mediocre. It's not going to get any attention. Or do we make some bullshit? And then you get people like, you know, writing reviews or talking on YouTube about how terrible it is. Well, then, you know, me ranting about this movie is probably going to get someone to click on it. Mm-hmm. more sure. than if I said oh it's whatever it's okay sure so I feel like these choices are deliberate like these people these filmmakers that's their job and they're given opportunities and because they can't do what they want to do they know it's bad there's, there's no way that they don't know that what they're making is bad and that's what's bothering me it's like where's the integrity like it's not the worst thing I've ever seen but again if without this cast and this director uh, if, if somebody that's not notable had written this i think they would have been clocked for being extremely derivative and i don't know that they would have been able to get the budget for this film because if you want to make schlock then do it there are people who've done it and they have strong careers and we love them for it so like like i feel like then you should have made this movie fun like if you know it's going to be bad if you know the writing's not there that then make it fun and over the top but i cannot recommend this at all mm. Uh, Same. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.